Hey, blessings everyone. All right, so this is another uh, prayer package um, for the brothers and sisters in Christ that are making prayer requests. I'm catching up on a lot of them. There's still a lot more to go. And um, I've seen your comments for those who are requesting prayer, and I will get to you. Just uh, be patient with me as I continue to comb through the many that I have a backlog on. My fault, really, because I was not being attentive to taking care of this uh, specific assignment. I thank the Lord for the extension that he has given me to complete this. Uh, it's a lot <laughs> to go. Um, and I am knocking it down one at a time. And we will get through this together. And I will be sure to touch um, bases with everyone. Uh, that has submitted a prayer request. Uh, it will come sometime in the future, uh, and we'll keep pressing together uh, on this assignment until it gets done. Amen. All right, so this is for a brother that goes by the YouTube name Jesus Saves, and the prayer request says the following. Please pray for my spouse. I am not sure if she is saved. I also ask that you would pray for my dad. I don't believe he is saved, and he is a really humble and kind man. I care more about them saved than anything thanks all right brother uh jesus saves so the two strategic areas uh for this prayer request just to hone in on a more uh, focal point the first one is salvation for spouses uh, for spouse and this is a very important um, request like many of the prayer requests are very important because these are the, some of the highlighted things that uh, we are all facing in the body of Christ and want to petition heaven to see the Lord move upon these situations in favor. Um, so we, many of us are in marriages uh, where we have one spouse that believe or, and another one uh, that doesn't believe, whether they never believe or they backslidden. And so we pray for them uh, that they will find Jesus before they depart this world. And another one is salvation for dad. Um, and this too is important because many of us have parents that are not saved and we intercede and pray that they be saved, especially for those who have parents in the late latter year of their life where they don't have much time left before they leave and we want to see them saved. All right. So these um, two strategic areas are very important. And for those who have the same issue, um, uh, we'll be you guys will be able to touch um, touch hands in agreement with me and that we will pray on this together. Uh, for everyone in a body of Christ that's having um, the same uh, the same issue, we'll say, where we have an unbelieving spouse we want to see safe, and we have unbelieving family members, like blood fam family members, particularly our parents that are not safe. Um, so once again, this seems to be like a disclaimer of mine. Uh, we're going to go through uh, some scriptures speaking about salvation in this particular area. And nothing that I say is intentionally targeted towards you, uh, Jesus says, or anyone else. It's just that as I go through the leading of the Holy Spirit and speaking on what the word of God has to say about it. It is the truth um, to the best of my ability and my ability to humble myself before the Lord and be submissive to the Holy Spirit that I can speak to you in which you will hear it. I have no agenda when I do this. I have nothing that I try to promote for myself at all. This is not my thing at all. I do not want to see myself edified um, on top of Christ. Never. You know, I want to keep myself as humble and submissive to the one that we work for, the one that we're doing this for, Jesus Christ, and not looking to myself for any publicity. So we have a few scriptures we're going to look through. And as I said before, don't think that I'm targeting this at you. This is just what the scripture says. And it is important that we know the truth because when we know the truth, then the truth can set us free. And so we begin um, looking at Acts chapter 13, verse 47. And the way that I have been doing it uh, for those who've been following is I have the scripture and I have notes that I write down to keep the thoughts together. And sometimes I could go ahead and elaborate on some of the notes to give more of a driving point to what the meaning um, really is. <clears throat> and so beginning of verse 47 of Acts chapter 13, and it says, For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. So screening through the uh, the notes that I have here so we can set the foundation for prayer. So this way, when we do pray, we could pray in accuracy in the word of God. And what I have here, it says, when we get saved in Jesus Christ, all right, we are bought from the kingdom of darkness, which was ruled by Satan and is ruled by Satan. You know, we're bought from that kingdom of darkness and we are bought into the, into the kingdom of light, which is ruled by Jesus Christ. 
right? So though we cannot see it with the natural eye, with our with our eyes of the flesh, every born again believer becomes indwelled with the light of God. It is a light that can only be seen in the spirit. All right, so this is not something we can see in the flesh because the scripture says the flesh profiteth nothing. So this light that we have received from the Lord, this light that we have indwelling in us is seen in the spirit, in the spirit man. So every living being upon this earth can see the light within a believer through the spirit man within them. This is why, for example, brothers and sisters, that in a natural, you will have people that you don't know or people you do know who would say such things to you as you're glowing or there is something special about you and I just can't put my finger on it or I don't know why but something draws me to you like something draws my attention to you or you may just get a simple you must be a Christian even though you've never said anything about being a Christian at all that is because of the light of God that is in you that is that is shining brightly and so this is the natural world seeing the light of God within you through their spiritual eye so the Lord's intention in doing this, right? So why does the Lord do this? We read it in the scripture. The Lord's intention in doing this is to show the world through you who Christ is. The answer the world is looking for is living within you, brothers and sisters. And it's living it within you too, uh, between all of us, all right? So everybody that's called by the name of Christ, they, that they, they, the, the answer that the world has been waiting for because we've been praying to the Lord to see the hand of God move. And we're wondering, why is it that the Lord has not moved upon our situation? Why is he not moving upon um, the events on the world stage? If you realize in the kingdom of darkness, the devil is moving his kingdom upon earth through people. You see that through people, everything that is happening today with the calamities and the disasters and stuff like that, that we're witnessing and we know those of the elite, quote unquote, you know, are uh, their plans that they that they seek to carry out upon the earth. The enemy is using people with resources to do this. So the answer to the world's problem right now lies within you. It is the Christ in you that has the answer to the world's problem. And the Lord has given every provision and every tool that you will need in a specific area of this fight to be able to carry on his kingdom purpose upon the earth. So within the vessels of God's people is the answer to speak against, to go against what the kingdom of darkness is doing. And this is access through our ability to tap into prayer and petition before the king in heaven. Think of Esther. At the, the key to the people's deliverance, the key to the people in Israel, their deliverance rests simply in one person. It was in Esther. Her ability to go before the king, using her authority to go before the king and petition for the life of her people. So in the same way, we who are called by Christ are like in Esther. We have authority. We're dressed in royalty. We are his royal sons and daughters. And we have the key, the authority to petition the king who would then move upon these situations. And so now, as we press on, it says, if a person lived their entire life in darkness, and this is important to understand so we can empathize with those who are living a sinful lifestyle. It says, if a person lived their entire life in darkness, they will not understand light. They will not understand what light is when they see it. Because this, this light will be foreign to them. And the only way they can react to this is through what they know, which is through the darkness in them and a the sinful nature. Because when we're born into this world, we're born into darkness in need of, a, of salvation, in need of Jesus to save us. So many of them who've never been touched by the light when they see it don't know what it is. They cannot comprehend it because they only know what darkness is like. Is like. So therefore, we have a responsibility to teach the oppressed who only knew the darkness their whole life, their whole life, I'm sorry, what this light is so they may understand and be saved. When we go to Matthew chapter 5, verse uh, 14 through 19, it says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but, uh, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light 
unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Think not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So in a world plagued with great darkness, the Lord declares that we are that light in the world. We are the light of the world, the light that shines his glory in a dark world that is looking for an answer. So the greater the darkness comes upon the earth, the greater we see the darkness become. Understand that the brighter the light that, would, that is within you, that is within me, that, that is within us, will become. The brighter that light will become because of the darkness. So therefore, Christians, brothers and sisters, we must gird up our minds and be prepared for action. And a, reason, and a question is why? Why is it that we must gird up our minds? Well, as the darkness becomes greater in the world, it will become more and more obvious that we who have the light of God in us are Christians. They will know this because of God's light that is within us. And so it would not matter if we never say a thing about our Christian faith. The spirit man within every soul upon the earth will see your spiritual light and many in the kingdom will be persecuted because of that light. Because remember, many have never known the light but only darkness. And when they see the light, they only know how to react to the light based on the darkness that is in them. So remaining upon the sidelines as Christians will soon and very soon no longer be an option for us. Either we will stand for the light or we will exchange it for the darkness. There will be no gray area in the time to come. So now is the time to prepare our minds to stand for the light if we choose to stand by God. And if we choose, if we do not know which side we want to be on, then the, the answer, the choice has already been made for you. So if we stand for the light, then we must do the works of light so man can see the fruits, the living and active demonstration of what the light is so they may understand and be saved. This is our responsibility. You see, the world sees our light already. So what they are waiting on is to see the demonstration of what that light offers so they can leave behind the darkness. They can leave behind Satan and come home to Jesus. And so the Ten Commandments teaches us how to operate in the light through the power of God's love. To reject the, the commandments, the Ten Commandments, is to reject the call to demonstrate his divine light to a lost and dying world. So therefore, to minimize the importance of the Ten Commandments is to minimize your position and inheritance in heaven because you have thrown away the blueprints that has been set out to teach us uh, how we live as people of light to show the world what the light looks like. Acts chapter 4 verse 10 through 12 and it says, Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom ye crucified whom God raised from the dead even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And so therefore, listen to this, um, to this quick statement. It's going to sound weird at first, but listen to it through. There are many paths that leads to God. But only one path will get you into heaven, and this path is only found in Jesus Christ. For we know the scripture says it is appointed for every man to die then face judgment. So therefore, it doesn't matter what path a person takes in life. Eventually, that path will lead him to God. 
But whether they enter through the gates into heaven, that is a different story altogether. And so our own righteousness is not enough to get us into heaven. If we were able to get into heaven by our own righteousness, then Jesus would never have to uh, have had to die for our sins to begin with. So therefore, there is no such thing as a good man or woman in hell. Good people do not go to hell. The only way a person can truly be a good person, worthy of heaven, is by one thing alone. Is that they receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so sometimes we are tempted to judge someone's salvation because of the lifestyle that they live. But even a person who lived a great life, looking after orphans, taking care of the poor and needy, being a comforter to the destitute, can find themselves missing out on heaven if they reject Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And why is that? Well, that's because we have a sin issue that prevents us from getting into heaven. Jesus paid the price for our sin issue. So if we are one in him, covered in his blood, we can make it through the gates. If the sin issue is never resolved in our hearts by the blood of Jesus, then every deed we did in good faith upon earth would have all been in vain come judgment day. And so therefore, Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. And that no one comes to the Father except through the Son, Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 19, verse 9 through 11. And it says, And Jesus said unto him, This day salvation come to this house, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save which was lost. And as they heard these things, he added and back a parable, because he was nigh to Jerusalem. And because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. And so this here is telling you is that the mission of our Lord was to seek and save that which was lost, not to judge and condemn that which is lost. You see, in the body of Christ, we have this mindset that we believe, you know, and when we have this religious Pharisee type of spirit, that we can go around and judge and condemn. It is the Lord who makes the decision on Judgment Day who will make it in and who will not, because only the Lord knows the heart. Now, am I saying that we must be silent on speaking of the uh, the matter concerning sin? No, we give the truth. But to judge how the truth touches somebody is not our place. Because the Lord said that when he came upon the earth, right? We know that when the Lord came upon the earth, he set the example that we ought to do what he did. And so the pattern he left for us is to seek and save that which is lost, not judge and condemn, lest we speak judgment upon ourselves. Romans 10 verse 9 through 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy hearts that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So basically, with all the many different doctrines of salvation and how a person is to be saved, the scripture tells us that we must repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized. Repent means to turn away from sin, turn away from living the lifestyle of hell, which is what worldliness really is. Because when we live a worldly lifestyle, the only thing that we're doing is pattering after that which is in hell and bringing it upon the earth's surface. So we turn away from that lifestyle and look to the lifestyle of the kingdom of God. Repent and be baptized. And what does the baptism process entail? So there's a two-step process for one to be saved, right? So you repent and be baptized. So you repent from your sins. You turn away from it. And it says that we must be, we must make a a confirmation, a a declaration. We must declare with our very mouth that we receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, as Lord of our life. And that confession must be a truth. 
that does not rest in our minds, treating it intellectually in which we have done. We've treated the salvation of God on an intellectual basis where we think we can go ahead and debate this in an intellectual way. No. When we receive, when we make that confession that Jesus Christ is Lord, it's a confession that we are taking its truth to the very depths of our hearts, of knowing the wretched people we were and seeing the grace, the powerful love that Jesus had to die for us to, and taking our place in hell. So this way we do not have to spend there for all of eternity, but be with him in heaven. So that's that confirmation you make with your mouth and that you hold firm to that truth in your heart not in your mind. And so with this, through the process of baptism, where we, where we share in his death and resurrection, where we die to our old self, how we're buried and it come up, declaring that we are making our decision that we have decided to follow Jesus and there is no turning back to Egypt. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 through 28 and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. We spoke about this. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So it is appointed for man to die once, but for those who reject Jesus, twice. So Jesus, he bore upon himself the second death of eternal condemnation in hell, which was meant for each and every one of us. So that although we may experience a temporary death, right, the death in our flesh, which we see happen since the time began, which also exists in the temporal world, right, the first death, we enter into eternal life through him forever because he has swallowed up the second death in victory. So therefore, that death has no sting upon us. For as we live, leave this corrupted flesh behind and we're tapping into our spirit man, the sting of death cannot touch us because Jesus has already swallowed that in him when he bore our sins on the cross. So therefore, there is no comprehension of the second death once we leave our mortal bodies, brothers and sisters. The second death does not touch us. There's no experience of it. Once this flesh dies and a spirit begins to rise up, the only thing it will know, our spirits will know, is life and life more abundantly. John 6, verse 47. <clears throat> and it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. So as the Lord declared concerning his selection of David as king in place of Saul, Man looks at the outer appearance, but the Lord, he is the one that looks at the heart. So although in the outer appearance, right, it may seem like a person is not saved because of their lifestyle. It is only the Lord who truly knows what is in their, in their heart and where they stand. And so no one is perfect, nor is found worthy enough to, to enter into heaven. Though we may have a, our judgments upon a person's life. It is only the Lord who knows the condition of that person's salvation. So when we see one of our brothers and sisters struggling, struggling with sin, right? It is our duty to pray for them and show the truth of the word to them and not condemn them lest we want that same measure of judgment upon our life when we fall into a struggle, a snare with sin. John 3, verse 16 through 17 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And so a religious spirit condemns those who are lost while a spirit which is kingdom minded seek to save them for Jesus. So remember, the Lord did not come into the world to be the chief Pharisee. For we saw that in the life of Paul and what ended up turning and how that ended up turning out to be for his life. Because if the Lord came to be chief Pharisee and operate the way that the Pharisees did, then surely that would be the law that is in effect today, but it's not. When Jesus came into the world, he shook the foundations of the Pharisees, um, turning that world upside down. 
And even Paul, who walked with that spirit of a Pharisee, he had to go through a Damascus Road experience. Because the Lord had to tell him, Paul, why are you persecuting me? So when we walk around with this religious spirit in the church, judging our brothers and sisters and thinking we have authority, because we are, uh, we feel that we're justified, we're righteous by obeying the law, we are not persecuting our brothers. We're persecuting Christ. Remember that he, Jesus, he came to undo the work of the devil to set the captives free. And so part of this mission was to undo the destructive work which was being released from the synagogue of Satan. And so when we condemn others, we judge them. We, we judge them under the law and not under the grace through faith which can lead their hearts to Christ. And so when we condemn others, not only do we put them under the law in our minds, we in turn, right, we put ourselves under the law and will be judged by it instead of grace. Because remember what the scripture says, by the same measure in which we judge others would be the measure upon us. And so when we see someone walking in error, it is our responsibility to tell them the truth as it is written in the word. But we must never sit as a final authority, as a final judge, and determining whether they will go to heaven or hell. On a day we leave this earth and enter into glory, we are going to find many surprises in heaven. As we witness those who we thought would never make it are in heaven, and those that we were so sure would have made it into heaven did not. So what's the bottom line? Do not judge anybody and be humble always. First Peter three, verse one through two. And it says, likewise, ye wise be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they may also without the word be won by the conversation of the wise while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. So this here touch basis also on a strategy um, that uh, we're sharing in this prayer request about the unbelieving spouse. Well, a few things to, to note from this. When it comes to being married with an unbelieving spouse, we must make it our priority and every effort to keep the unity of the marriage. This is why in this example, it said wives ought to submit to their unbelieving husbands. We have a responsibility that as we try to share the gospel with them, we're not creating chaos in the home. For it says that wives should be subjection to your own husband, to your unbelieving husband, right? And so we're talking about even husbands who have unbelieving wives. Continue to lo love them, show the love of Christ in them, and support them. We have to keep the unity of the marriage because the marriage is still sanctified in accordance with the word of God because at least one of the two are saved. And so through the unity that is maintained, do we by, the, by word and deed show them what the light is? So through your example, they may be won over for Christ. So keep the unity and share your light through how you live for Jesus. And always pray for them continually. Next, we're in Romans chapter 10, verse 1 through 9. And it says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, that they might be saved. And this is the Lord's ultimate heart desire, that all should, that all should be saved and none should perish. And it says, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, right? A form of righteousness, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So they have not humbled themselves to the righteousness of God where we have, we're justified by grace through faith, but in seeking out their own righteousness, they thought to be right under the law. And it says, for Christ is the end of, of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So the standard of the law being set for righteousness, the Lord Jesus put it into it when he fulfilled it and put it upon the cross. And it says, For Moses described the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth these things shall live by them. Not a single person was able to keep the law. 
Verse 6, But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thy hearts, Who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, to the deep that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And this how this is how one is found to be established in righteousness before God. And so the notes, Christ is the end of the law in the way man once sought to use it to be considered righteous by works. To justify one's own righteousness by measuring themselves on how they keep the law of God has inadvertently allowed a, religi a, a religious Pharisee spirit within them. With the Pharisee spirit comes pride in believing your ways are just while others are wrong. This spirit calls for condemning saints who are nothing more than a brand plucked from the fire. Those under... The religious spirit had barred themselves from entering into the kingdom because of pride in their hearts. And they also seek to prevent others from entering through by the use of judgmental words set on fire by the very pits of hell itself. Their tongues are like serpents. Their words are like a brood of vipers. And unless they humble themselves before the Lord Jesus and repent, they face an unfortunate future. And finally, the last scripture before we go into prayer. Psalms 19, verse 7 through 10. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous all together. So while we are no longer under law, but by grace through faith, the law serves a new purpose now. The law of God and its perfection is now to be used as a mirror to the soul to show us our need for a savior, Jesus Christ. We use the law to reveal the nature of death we live in and this so-called flesh and what wages are awarded to those who cannot keep the law in perfection. So we use it to show how Jesus was able to fulfill this perfect law, and through him we are now saved if we receive him as our Redeemer. And so we study the law and uphold it, no longer to be used as our, a tool for our own self-righteousness, no longer to be used to condemn those who can't keep it, because the scripture shows, for the Lord has took our condemnation upon himself, but rather as a schoolmaster, bringing us to Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. Let us go into prayer now to activate the strategy, these petitions. Father, we thank you so much for hearing the prayers of your people. We thank you so much for what Jesus says and sharing this prayer request in which many in the body of Christ are praying for in regards to their spouses and their parents, O oh God. Father, we know only you can change the heart and only you can see the heart. And so right now, Father, we're joined together to pray for our spouses that are not saved, O oh God, whether they've never been saved or they backslidden and we desire to see them come back to you. We pray, Father, that you will have your way in their life right now to start changing their heart, converting their heart, and bringing it back to you. For, Father, our greatest desire is to see that they make it into heaven. Our greatest desire, Father, is for them to be with you and us for all eternity and not burn in the pits of hell. For many great things they've done for us, O oh God, our spouses and parents. They sacrificed much. They were there for us, Father, through many of the ups and downs our, of our life and showed us and showed us such great love, O oh God, that many of us have never even experienced in this cold world. But yet, Father, we know that if they do all these many great acts of love, these deeds of love, but yet they receive you not, then it is all in vain as they will have nothing to show for it come judgment day. And we so now, Father, we're crying out to you and that you will save our loved ones. May you save our mother, our father, 
our wives and our husbands, O oh God, in every situation, O oh God, that they're in around the world, that they shall be called to you, O oh God. And that they shall begin to cry out to you, O oh God. And we know, Father, that in order for this to happen, it means that we must trust you. We must trust you in the process that you will have to lead them, Father, to bring them to you. For for, for some, O oh God, it can be as easy as showing a touch of your love. A showing a touch, Father, of how you love them so much. A demonstration of it. But for others, Father... It will require that they go through a hard path to break their hearts of stone, which has hardened their hearts against you, O Lord, that has hardened it towards you. And so we pray, Father, that this will be the day that we would see the change happen in our families, that this will be the day, the day, Father, in which that they shall be saved and that they shall begin to come to your people, O God, those who are called by your name that is carrying this light, who are light bearers of your glory, O God, that they begin to come and ask the question, how can they be saved? May you create the opportunities, O God. May you give us the wisdom that we need, O God, the knowledge, the understanding. May you give us the humility, O God, and the ability to speak in love, the simple truth of your gospel to convert these souls back to you. Lord, you said, for the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And great is the harvest within our own homes, O oh God. And that it is only just and right that we speak to our family members about you, Father, before we even would think to go out into the world. For many of us, Father, it is a hard thing to speak to our parents about salvation, about you, because of the, familiar, the familiarity that we have with them. And so we pray, Father, that you will give us the reality check and a realization of understanding that they may end up going to hell. And if they die and they know you not, there'll be no turning back from this. And we will be held accountable for showing cowardice and showing a lack of love for our parents, that we don't love them enough to try to save them and love them out of hell. For truly, Father, how can we say that we love our parents if we're willing to allow them to perish in the lake of fire? May you give us a heart check, Father, to put aside our pride, our ideas concerning the matter, our personalities concerning the thing, O oh God, and to see our parents, Father, as somebody who can be anybody just in the streets that need to be saved, that need a touch from you to come into your kingdom. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the spouses and the parents that shall be saved. We love you, Lord, and may you continue to keep us covered in this time, Father, and not to give up on our prayers until we see that they, that the prodigals come back to you. We love you, Father, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.